combat outpost wilderness. They they were just getting fucked up, left and right. Like left and right, we stayed getting all the casualties from them, day in and day out. And you get a casualty who took the blast of a vehicle IED from a motorcycle, and you try your best to save his life. It's, it just ain't shit you can do to save his life. Being honest with you, my days as a line medic, as a, you know, a, a ground medic is over. It's over, right? But all you want is blood. You see that kind of shit and all you want is blood. What do you do with rage when you don't have any place to point it but inward? When there is no satisfaction in revenge and no way to put things right? Marcus Freeman spent nearly a decade as a combat medic, fighting the insurgencies both in Iraq and in Afghanistan with his healing power as much as with his weapons. But some wrongs can't be righted. They can only be reckoned with. And when you can't do the reckoning, the price you pay can be tremendous. I was going to kill myself. I came home and I knew if I went into my house, it was over. So I walked into my backyard and I have a dog back there, a German Shepherd. And I was trying to work on making like a walking stick, right? I was like, all right, just focus on making a walking stick. So I took this piece of wood and I just started to like whittle it down until I could get there. Because I knew if I walked in my house, like it was a fucking wrap. And then my wife came home and she was like, what's going on? And I was like, this is how I feel right now. And, you know, she was like, you need to go get help. Striking the balance between inflicting damage and easing suffering is a lot to ask of a soldier. But it pretty much is the job description of a combat medic. The difficulty is... When it's time to stop shooting and start healing, you can lose a sense of where the wounds you treat stop and where the blood you spill starts. It can harden you to the suffering of others for a time, but eventually your humanity either has to shine through or disappear completely. For Marcus Freeman, it was almost the latter. What is true bravery? What makes a hero a hero? Tested by the worries of what's happening at home, thousands of miles away, and the reality of what you're facing here and now. When your life is in danger every second, and it's either kill or be killed. From Wondery and Incongruity Media, this is Anthony Russo, and this is war. Dating is exhausting as it is, and online dating can be tedious. If you ever have tried online dating, you know that you've had to deal with lazy text messages and dead-end conversations, or random matches that don't really even turn into dates. eHarmony has been working at perfecting the online dating process to help people who are interested in cultivating long-term relationships find one another. As a result, eHarmony takes steps that other dating sites don't in order to find you a more compatible match. There are plenty of hookup sites out there. This is not what they are. eHarmony has helped more than a million people find their perfect match. A colleague of mine here at Wondery was a huge fan of the site. She said the questionnaire had a ton of great questions that really get you to dig deep and think about your personality, your preferences, and your perceptions. But still, the whole process was very easy and intuitive. One of the questions listed a bunch of different descriptive personality traits and asked, which four words would your best friends choose to describe you? She actually sent a screenshot of that to several of her closest friends just to see what they'd say. And she said that it was really cool to see what their perspective of her was. Once she was done, she got lots of messages. 
She said it seemed as if eHarmony had been working overtime all weekend trying to find compatible profiles. Moreover, she thought it was cool to see a breakdown of why compatible profiles were matched. For example, they provided a percentage of compatibility based on exclusivity, accommodation, and relationship values. All in all, so far, she already considers it a success. Stop waiting and start your journey to a satisfying, meaningful relationship. It can be fun to play around with online dating apps, but when you're ready to fall in love with someone and have a meaningful relationship, there's one app that's built to bring you real love. eHarmony. Come see how eHarmony can change your life. Go to eHarmony.com and get started. Enter my code, THISISWAR, at checkout. Military service always was in the cards for Marcus Freeman. He was bright and did well in high school, but even the prospect of going to college couldn't hold his interest. He wanted to serve in the military and had tended that way for much of his high school career. His father, Fred, had different plans for him, and those definitely included college. Marcus had a keen mind and a lot of potential, but he was the kind of kid who could pretty easily get swept up into army life and end up spending his career as a GI. That just wasn't something that Fred wanted for his son. So I was already in JROTC, right? And I told my dad, you know, like I wanted to go to the army. So he extended his hand, like they have bullets this big. And just, you know, just imagine how big, big is. And he's like, they have bullets this big. You know, put it in your brain this big. But like, it didn't scare me. So bottom line, I had a um, army recruiter come to my house, talk to my dad. So that day, after talking to the recruiter, like he beat my ass. And from there, I was coerced to go to the Navy. At the time, it seemed like an acceptable compromise. Fred could have his kid continue to develop intellectually in the Navy, and Marcus could satisfy his desire to be in the service. It wasn't as physically demanding as Marcus had hoped, and he found basic training pretty easy. In school, he directed his attention toward cryptology, which gave him the opportunity both to use his intellect and feel as if he were part of something bigger, getting a sense of where his service fit in in the larger geopolitical world. He wouldn't be a ground fighter, but at the time, there weren't really any opportunities for battle anyway. All that changed the very day he got his top secret clearance. We're in class and another person walked in and was like, hey, can I talk to you for a minute? Talk to, you know, to the instructor. And they walked out and then we were just there in class, not thinking nothing of it. They both walked in and it was like, hey, who's from New York? I was like, I am. And he was like, you have any family? I was like, no. And then like, we finally went to another room, turned the TV on and then I literally watched the second tower fall. And there's, you can see, perhaps the second tower, the front tower, the top portion of which is collapsing. There are no words. As I watched that tower fall, I was like, yo, this is... Like, like I fucked up. I should be doing something else. Marcus had been born in Brooklyn, and... Though his family had moved him west, he still had an affinity for his hometown. He was filled at rage at its defilement. He'd spent another two years in the Navy and, as that came to a close, he prepared to jump ship. By 2004, it was clear that the U.S. Army didn't have the manpower needed to sustain a two-front war in the Middle East. Recruitment efforts were flagging, and so the Army initiated the Blue to Green program in 2005, to allow Air Force and Navy fighters to migrate to the Army. It wasn't a decision that took Marcus very long to make. Even though he had a really good signing bonus as a cryptologist, Marcus wanted to get into the fight. So at the time, I was going to re-enlist for $30,000 and a re-enlistment bonus to, to Suda Bay, Greece, which is off the island of Crete and a top picker school of my choice. I denied all of that to re-enlist as a infantryman. I remember going to like a bayonet 
range. So you have like your rifle and then attach a bayonet to it, like like a knife. And we spent like four or five hours out there. And we just did drill after drill after drill. We was there from the morning time. We had lunch there. And then we did more drills. By the time I left there, like I was like, yo, I want to kill someone right now. I was ready. I was ready. Marcus was fueled solely by a sense of outrage and revenge that supplanted all thoughts of career and even vocation. He just wanted to fight, and he didn't care how. He took a downgrade in pay, rank, and responsibility to become a ground fighter in the army. He felt like he needed to get into the fight as soon as possible. Basic training seemed interminable, but eventually, as part of the Blue to Green Try One program, Marcus was switched to the Arizona National Guard. The idea was you spent a year in the National Guard with the opportunity to switch over to active duty when your first year was over. Marcus was fine with that, so long as he had a gun and an enemy upon whom to train it. It didn't take long for him to get his wish. Eventually, he found himself in Mosul, where patrols beset by small arms, RPG, and IED attacks were the order of the day. We were taking small arms fire from a mosque, right? And we stopped to engage in this combat. I got out of my Humvee, which was not up armored at all. And I'm shooting at a mosque. (laughs) It's crazy. Imagine looking at a building that you're shooting at and you see a rocket come at you, right? Like a fucking rocket. come Like an RPG comes at you. It hits the ground. It skips off the ground. Then skips again off the ground. Then slides between the car that you're behind and the car that you're in front of. Just slides and then doesn't explode. I don't know if it was like it was slow motion in my mind or whatever but it just I actually watched it hit the ground skip and then skip again and just go past me in between my the truck I was behind and the truck that was in front of me what Marcus found out pretty early in his tour was that as an infantryman there wasn't going to be a lot of retreating It wasn't just a case of, if fired upon, return fire. It was a case of, if fired upon, do whatever it takes to end the opposition. Checking the mosque afterwards, there were only bodies, no wounded. Anyone who wasn't dead had escaped to fight another day, and there was always another day of fighting in Iraq. What was clear, though, was that Marcus saw, and still sees, the war as a very personal thing, He has no illusion that it's a black and white proposition geopolitically, but practically, there is only one response to being fired upon. Eliminate the threat however you can. There was only one way the confrontation at the mosque possibly could have ended. We we killed everybody. It's great. You know, I mean, I I don't know what you want me to say. No, no, we didn't run away from nothing. Like, it was going down. You know, everybody's dying. Everybody's dying. They weren't there to negotiate. They were there to patrol and started taking fire. There is no negotiation. For Marcus, though, there were limits to pure infantry. As much as he might sound like it, he was no adrenaline junkie. He was in the infantry for a purpose, retaliation and doing his part to win the war on terror. As his try one year in the National Guard came to a close, Marcus set his eyes on a new way he could be a tool for victory. He decided he wanted to become a medic. I wanted the ground action, and I wanted something that, that had a direct, like a payoff, really, right? So in cryptology, you had a piece of a piece of a piece of a piece of a pie. And then like you sent that piece up, but you never got to see, like... 
what that equated to, right? As a medic, if I save someone's life, that equates to I brought somebody's father, somebody's mother home, right? And to me, that was, you know, that was a big deal. One of the cool things that I learned as a medic was, you know, like they say that the queen of battle is infantry. And the king of battle is artillery. But the god of the battle is a combat medic because we decide who lives and who dies. It sounds arrogant a little bit, the god of battle. But that's not the important phrase in Marcus's medic philosophy. The operative word for him was decides, that the medic decides who lives and dies. Throughout his time as a combat medic, Marcus celebrated the victories, the lives he saved or helped to save, but he also mourned the deaths in a very personal way. There can be no credit without blame, and Marcus saw a death on his watch as a personal failure. After all, if the medic is the god of battle, the age-old question is always present. Why does God let bad things happen? It's a question he dealt with almost immediately upon his first tour as a medic, which happened to coincide with the bloodiest year in the war in Afghanistan. Are you hiring, posting your position to job sites and waiting and waiting for the right people to see it? ZipRecruiter knew there was a smarter way, so they built a platform that finds the right job candidates for you. ZipRecruiter learns what you're looking for, identifies the people with the right experience, and invites them to apply for your job. These invitations have revolutionized how you find your next hire. In fact, 80% of employers who post a job on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate through the site in just one day. And ZipRecruiter doesn't stop there. They even spotlight the strongest applications you receive so you never miss a great match. The right candidates are out there. ZipRecruiter is how to find them. Businesses of all sizes trust ZipRecruiter in their hiring needs. Right now, my listeners can try ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash thisiswar. That's ZipRecruiter.com slash thisiswar. ZipRecruiter, the smartest way to hire. I want to tell you about Bombas socks. You know when you put on a quality piece of clothing and you can tell right away? That was my experience with Bombas. They have a weight and a texture that lets you know exactly how they're going to feel even before you put them on. And that's cool, but it isn't the coolest part. For me, the coolest part was the honeycomb arch support. You know how when you get your feet rubbed and someone squeezes right around the arch? It's like that, but gently and all day. They genuinely make my feet feel better. Bombas was founded with the mission to donate socks to people in need. Because you can't donate used socks, socks are the most sought-after item at homeless shelters. The folks at Bombas knew the only way to support their mission was by selling a lot of socks. And instead of going super cheap, they went super high quality, and it paid off. So far, Bombas has donated more than a million socks, and they're just getting started. They sent me a pair of socks called Americanos, which are ankle socks that are just like half a step below slippers comfort-wise. I ended up buying more for myself. For every pair of Bombas socks you buy, Bombas donates one pair to someone in need. And, if you purchase the Americano socks specifically, they'll donate a pair to a homeless vet through their partnership with the VA. It's super cool that they're doing this, especially since the socks are worth it all on their own. You can check out the Americano socks front and center on the bombas.com slash thisiswar page. You also can save 20% by visiting bombas.com slash thisiswar. That's B-O-M-B-A-S dot com slash thisiswar and entering the offer This Is War in the checkout code space. Bravado isn't bravery. 
It is the projection of false bravery to mask fear. On the surface of it, Marcus seemed full of bravado, but in reality, he wasn't pretending not to be afraid. He was suspending fear and doubt. Bravado can fail and descend into cowardice. But pushing fear and doubt aside in service of your duty is not a pretense. It's a perspective. For Marcus, the responsibility of bringing aid replaced all the other directives and all the other impulses. He would throw himself at saving the wounded with the same vigor that brought him out of the Navy and into the deserts of Iraq and Afghanistan, single-mindedly and without pause. You don't know what you don't know until it's right there in your face. The first casualty that I ever took in the field, I was just in the moment of treating him. Like, while my training kicked in, and I dragged him off behind a truck. We're on patrol, and he was there, and uh, he wasn't military. He was a civilian, and he got hit, and I could just tell right off the front from his injuries that he was dead. <laughs> but, um, but as a medic, you don't want to just be like, that guy's dead, right? You want to show your guys that you give a fuck. If it's a soldier or if it's, you know, not a soldier or if it's whatever. <laughs> so I started doing CPR on this guy, right? I'm doing CPR. I'm pretty much banging on his chest and breathing in his mouth. And uh, the blood from his mouth was in my mouth. And this is a an Afghanistan local national. So I don't have time to put a bag valve mask over his face and breathe into him. I want to save his life. So now his blood from his body is in my mouth. And I'm just like breathing into his mouth and then spitting out his blood from my mouth. And then doing chest compressions. And then we drove like two miles to call him a medevac. But, you know, he was, that dude was dead. He was, he was dead. As cocky as he might have seemed in victory was as chastened as he was in defeat. Whether it was a U.S. service person or a local national, a death fed Marcus's rage in a way that a victory didn't quench. He ate the rage of a loss and kept it to himself, and it wore upon him tour after tour, making him fight more fiercely to inflict damage and even more intensely to save the wounded. And his tours in Afghanistan gave him a lot of wounded to consider. As a scout, Marcus was part of a detachment that escorted Afghan national forces, army as well as police, to and from the forward operating bases, FOBs. The trip back and forth to FOB Tillman resulted in firefights as often as it didn't, and it became a question not of whether, but rather what kind of conflict would develop along the route. And it went on like this for years. Blood, and fire, and life, and death, through one tour after another. And the losses began mounting up. I was on a mission and came back, and I heard that he he was on a another cop, a combat outpost, and they had uh, received mortar fire, and he was dead. It was Christmas. I had just gotten my dinner, and uh, they told me that Gaffney was dead. So his wife was also in the military too, and she was there too. And this is the first person that taught me how to do everything in the military, in the army. And to hear that he was dead on fucking Christmas, I didn't want, I, I mean, I had my plate, like, we had shrimp, and we had steak, mashed potatoes, like, the whole nine yards. And I had a full plate. And, uh, you know, I just went to my room. I didn't even eat dinner that night. 
I just thought it was just fucked up. You just turn that to anger. You know? It's just anger. It's a lot of anger. And, like, I'm not saying that, like, you know, we went out and just kill people for no reason. It was just, you know, I hit the gym heavy, and I, you know, patrols is heavy, and, like, you want something to pop off because you want to fuck somebody up and give somebody a bad day, you know. But, it, it, it you know, it just doesn't come the second, the first, a third mission or in the fourth mission. But when it happens, you just, like, I'm going to give you everything I have to give you and some. Anger is a powerful weapon, and it is one on which the men and women who serve in combat can carry with them to tap into as required. But like any other volatile compound, there is only so much you safely can stockpile. And the more you have to lose, and the more losses of life that pile up on your psyche, the harder it becomes to channel that anger. Marcus did have a good turn of fortune. He fell in love with and married a fellow combat medic, Rena who was deployed with him. But as with other couples deployed together, there always was an underlying tension about the real dangers they faced every day. About the real dangers of married life in a war zone. It was something they experienced as part of their courtship under fire in Afghanistan. I watched an RPG come down towards us. We were on a mountain in Afghanistan. And then, like, it, for some reason, like, it turned and went arced up and then came down further down the mountain. And the nose of that RPG, it got slammed into the bicep of an interpreter. So when I watched that, I was like, I'm going to die. But when it arced up, I didn't know what was going on. For her to listen to a firefight go down between us and the enemy and then like me looking up thinking I'm going to die and then like a rocket comes down and just hits further down a mountain and you know wounds you know the interpreter and then we work on this guy and she's listening to all this and you know what I'm saying like it's it's a crazy life but I wouldn't trade it for nothing else Combat veterans talk about developing gallows humor over time, being able to laugh off what, from the outside, might seem horrific to someone without the same experience. But caught up in any joke or anecdote is the essential absurdity of life and death. When there is violence all around, when you have massaged a human heart in its chest or taped an amputated foot to a wounded soldier's leg so it won't get lost in transit, there aren't a lot of good ways to respond. You have to learn to laugh it off where you can. And when you can't, you just file it away for later. But how long before that final reckoning occurs is as unpredictable and as dangerous as any IED. From early on in the war, the Afghani insurgents understood that U.S. troop movements were like rain. What goes up the pass must come down. And so, while there often was fire one way, there nearly always was fire the other. Add to that the fact that stopping one vehicle essentially freezes the convoy, and you can get a sense of the chaos that accompanies a firefight in one of these cold mountain passes. We were being escorted by the Afghanistan police, and they took fire from insurgents, and then they, so then they stopped, started shooting. The pass that we're in was narrow, so I dismount, and um, I'm going towards this guy, and he's just like, been over like he got hit by a round so I take the guy I treat him like right there put a turnic on the guy so we're in the back of this vehicle and we have a uh a 50 cal machine gun in the turret it's just rocking and then you have my buddy John shooting off the grenades and then you have other guys shooting off you know regular army issue 556 five, 
So like brass is just like rolling back and forth of all types of calibers. And then this dude's bleeding out on the little thing I have set up. He's bleeding out from his arm and his back. And the crazy part was that like one of the snipers was deathly. <laughs> he was like, like he didn't like the sight of blood. It made him throw up. Like, I watched this guy blow a dude's body apart from less than a mile away. But five feet in front of him, blood was leaking. He just threw up. So it was blood, brass, and vomit on the floor of this truck. Right? So I managed to patch him up and get him to a hospital on time to save his life. Blood and puke and brass, continuous fire, and the screaming of a patient who had had the bad luck to have sustained six wounds from a single bullet passing through his body, and the uncertainty of how it is going to end today, and of what will happen tomorrow. Marcus's three tours as a combat medic in Afghanistan are compelling, amusing, or instructive in their own, but taken together they can be relentless. Remember, they aren't just stories. They are experiences that punctuated a life of service that had been directed at victory and revenge since September 11, 2001. Now, more than a decade later, there were stories and combat medic competition awards, there was the pride of service, and even a new wife and child. But there also were a pile of bodies and the memory of how so many of them passed from life into death. So we have a daughter named Gabby and we have a son named Max. His name's Maximus. I deployed a little over a year after Gabby was born. I went to Afghanistan in Fob Sharana, and I was a platoon sergeant for the evacuation platoon. And it's just, it's rough to look at your daughter, at your child, and see her grow up. But like, your average person will tell you, oh, yeah, you know, it's hard to see my child grow up without me. But it's way worse to see another man take his last breath in front of you. And then you go back to your room and talk to your child. That shit is horrible. One death in particular, one that occurred on the return trip after having saved the wounded Afghan national, would be transformative and would conjure demons in Marcus that he still struggles with today. I love talking to people and telling their stories. I love writing about people's experiences and the different places they've been and making this podcast. When I was putting together my personal website, though, I kept having trouble getting everything just right on my blog. Fortunately, I heard about Squarespace on a podcast and signed up. I knocked out my professional website in an afternoon using Squarespace because I wanted to spend my time making stuff, not fiddling with my website. Squarespace takes care of everything. They provide beautiful templates made by world-class designers and the templates are highly customizable. Squarespace provides award-winning 24-7 support, built-in SEO, and the thing that sealed the deal for me, free and secure hosting, as well as never having to patch or upgrade anything ever. Whether you're writing a blog, making a podcast, or starting an online business, Squarespace can help turn your cool idea into a new website. You can blog or publish content, sell products and services, or just showcase your work like I did. Make it yourself. Make it stand out. Squarespace is perfect for writers and artists, sports teams, personal trainers, photographers, and real estate agents. Anyone, really, who wants to focus on their passion rather than on their website. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial. And if you'd like to support this show, then please, when you're ready to launch, use the offer code THISISWAR to save 10% on your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com, offer code this is war.
F.O.B. Tillman was named for Pat Tillman, who left the NFL to become an Army Ranger and was killed by friendly fire in 2004. But even nearly a decade later, the region near the Afghan-Pakistani border remained a hot spot. The passes provided cover for the insurgents and left little for the convoys. The upshot was, it was a place of exquisite violence in a region where death and destruction were the order of the day. This area had hundreds of years of pent-up rage, and it never missed the opportunity to visit it upon the guilty and innocent alike. We're coming back from Bob Tillman, right? And we got into an engagement or an attack, and uh, we call for fire, right? But when you call for fire, sometimes the fire, you know, the fire mission that you have, that, that, that you request, it's not always accurate. So, you know, things happen. I'll leave it at that. But long story short, there's an explosion in a school. And I was there. This is like the same path. We had spray painted cow skulls on our trucks. So when we roll up and down the Manicandale Pass, they knew who the fuck was going through there, right? So they knew what time it was. And when we rolled through there that time and took that casualty, we had like lit people the fuck up. And then on the way back, it was going down. And then so eventually the shit got crazy going through the Manicandale Pass and we took fire. We had to call for fire and the school got fucked up and you work on kids. It's a different thing. It's a different, um, <clears throat> it's a different animal because like you have kids and you're going to see that kid that looks like your kid and you're going to want that kid to live because that's your kid in your mind. And then you work on babies that's there because they babies, you know, to me, a baby is like anything less than, you know, seven years, eight years old. It's a baby. And you look at, you know, babies that's just trying to live, trying to learn, trying to count to 10, trying to learn English, trying to, trying to spell words. And you just want them to survive for as long as you can. So let's say you have two people. One's a, you know, one's a child, one's an adult. They receive shrapnel, right? Or a blast. An adult will crash. Will crash faster than the kid. A kid will last longer. But once they start to dip, it's almost impossible to bring them back from that, that crash. It wasn't very far. We were right there. And, um, you know, we go there, we stop, and we go, and we go in, and it's just, it's just fucking messy. It's messy. You know, it's just, it's everywhere. Shit's everywhere. Blood has a, um, a copperish smell to it. I will always know what blood smells like. I know what blood smells like. I know what blood smells like in abundance. Return fire when fired upon. But this wasn't a mosque or some apartment building crawling with insurgents. This was a school that had the bad luck to be in a war zone. These weren't highly trained soldiers, men and women committed to a cause. These were kids at school. So what do you do? Do you fly into a rage? Do you tear at your hair and your clothes? Not if you have a job to do, and not if that job is saving lives. You put away the horror of walking into a school that has just been blown up 
and you think about your training. Push the picture of your daughter at home from your mind and get to work. You look at who's still breathing? Who has a pulse? Who, who can I save right now? Who can I save in a little bit? Who can I save later on? And then who, no matter what I do, I can't save. But I want to save. And the person who I wanted to save was a little Afghan girl. And we evac'd her. And I ended up going on my mission back to base. They called a mass cow, a mass casualty. That same girl arrived. She was all kinds of like, you know, she wasn't right. Four of her fingers were blown off, to say the least. I just wanted her to live. But she looked like my family. And then, like, she just didn't, didn't. I don't, I don't know her name. She was, uh, couldn't have been more than, like, like five years old. She was beautiful, man. She had, like, <clears throat> she's very beautiful. There were some male students I was able to take care of. And there were other kids you know, who received, I'll say, minimal injuries. So I walked to the bathroom, lit a cigarette up, took a piss in the, you know, like the porridge john and I just start crying. But I had a walkie-talkie on me, and it was like, hey, we got more, you know, incoming. So I had to, like, suck that up. Take that piss, take, you know, three pulls of my cigarette, and go back to the fucking, you know. There's nothing romantic about it. The smell of blood hanging over the whole scene as casualties from yet another attack come in. You try and stay outside your life. Try not to feel one way or the other about the things and people you're seeing. That's for a later time, if at all. Marcus Freeman pushed on until the end of his tour and headed home to see his own wife and children and do the best he could to repress both the horror and the unspent rage and the unsettled scores. That first firefight back in the mosque at Iraq, was a lifetime before. He had come to maturity in the Middle East, arriving as a gung-ho kid in his early 20s and finishing his most recent tour as a married career man in his 30s, for whom battle was a regular part of life. But leaving it all back in Afghanistan is a lot easier when you know your family is at home waiting for you. Man! <laughs> Coming home to a one-year-old who's only seen you in video. So I'll describe this. So I come home and my daughter, who was like a couple months old, then I deploy and I come back home. We're standing in formation, about to be dismissed to go reunite with our family. My daughter (laughs) runs in the mix of people. She she was like, hey, is that my dad? Like right there, she stops at my feet and I didn't realize that that was my kid. I was just locked in position. So someone had grabbed her and brought her back, you know, to my wife. And when they dismissed us, my daughter was there and she looked at me and she just ran. She ran to me in the face that I made She's five years old today. She's five. Gabby's five years old, 
just 13 years younger than her father was when he entered the Navy as a compromise measure before the towers fell. In those short years, her father went from cryptologist to infantryman to combat medic and spent four years seeing friends, enemies, and neutrals die violently and sometimes unmourned. He had brought with him a heart full of rage to the Middle East, where he couldn't sate his desire for revenge. But neither could he resist watching his animosity grow with each casualty he failed to save. He had been tough over his whole career. But in late 2017, Marcus Freeman had to find a way to reach down into his guts and save his own life. Fast forward to, to today, about two months ago, not even about, it was December, I was going to kill myself. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> it was a long time coming. I was a man's man. Well, I'm still a man's man. Fuck that. I've got four combat deployments. I've competed in the, in the army level best medic competition. I mean, like, I'm no, I know what I know. I'm 34. I turned 35 in four days. And I'm still no punk ass bitch. Like, I'm still about this life. I want this life. But at the end of the day, you're only as strong as your mind is. You can be as strong as you want to physically, but if your mind is brittle, you are nothing. And my wife came home from work. And I, I, she was like, what's going on out here? I was like, I'm suicidal, to put it plain and simple. And she was like, okay, what's your plan? I'm like, my plan is to go in the garage and leave myself out to death. And she was like, all right, let's, let's talk about it right now. We talked and talked and talked and talked and talked. Mind you, we got two kids to pick up in like an hour. Rena and Marcus talked it through. He tells this great story about his wife, about how she reached out to him when she was having trouble in her life and how they became friends even before they started dating. They established a bond of trust that sustained their friendship, courtship, and marriage through deployments where they were working side by side on the wounded, and through long separations where she was raising their children and he was in Afghanistan. But when it came to it, she was the one he was able to rely upon, and she came through for him. They picked up the kids, made a plan for getting Marcus into therapy, and continued on with their life together. You know, what happened with the Twin Towers, it's heartbreaking. It really is. To see your friends die, it's just heartbreaking, right? But my job is not killing. My job is saving lives. I save any life. I save all lives. And when you go to the battlefield, you can want all that you want for revenge or anger or whatever, but to see somebody bleeding out, somebody's life just leaving, and it's on you to bring them back, or to save, or to halt death, you will do whatever the fuck you have to do, to do what you do, to save a life, and it doesn't matter if it's the enemy, it doesn't matter if it's a friendly, or a non-combatant. You will do what you have to do. And that's the bottom line, man. Like, like, that's combat medicine. All day, every day. After all the death and loss, and after nearly becoming a casualty himself, Marcus Freeman is ready to be deployed again if necessary. Rena is still an army medic as well, but neither of them have deployments pending. Marcus hasn't forgiven or forgotten the September 11th attacks, even a little bit. But his perspective on war and the things that a man has to do have matured. He will still return fire without mercy if fired upon. 
but he has learned that returning fire that enthusiastically comes at a cost. It causes its own collateral damage that has to be treated like any other wound. Otherwise, it can spread and infect your soul. Next time on This Is War. And we weren't even outside two hours, and an IED went off. When the dust kind of starts to settle, you see this bus, and I mean, the whole side of the bus, the glass is all shattered. People are screaming. There were some casualties on the bus. The two that I saw, there was a, a baby that was, was cut up pretty good. To have that within your first two hours on your first mission, I mean, it's, it's eye-opening. You know, you realize, like, this is no joke. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you're listening right now. To find a link to subscribe to This Is War, show notes, and more information, simply tap or swipe over the cover art. You'll also see offers from our sponsors. Please help support our shows by supporting them. If you like what you've heard, we'd love it if you would give us a five-star rating and review. And be sure to tell your friends and show them how to subscribe. Another way you can support the show is by filling out a small survey at wondery.com slash survey. Are you a combat veteran, or do you know one with a story to tell? Reach out to us at stories at thisiswar.com with your dates and branch of service and a brief description of the experience you'd like to share. If you would like to hear more of This Is War and other Wondery shows, in addition to extra content, early access, and exclusive perks, you can subscribe at Wondery Plus. Go to wondery.com slash plus. I'm Anthony Russo. This is War was produced by Incongruity Media. Executive producer, Hernan Lopez for Wondery. If you're a veteran suffering from PTSD or suicidal thoughts, please visit veteranscrisisline.net or call 1-800-273-TALK. That is 1-800-273-8255. You also can text VeteransCrisisLine.net at 838-255.